Sunday service at Hope Church. It's good to see everyone on a crisp morning, afternoon now. Uh, why don't we stand and we'll go through the Apostles' Creed together. I'll pray for us and we'll go into worship. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we worship you in this house. God, all around the world, Lord, where uh, your church is worshiping you, we ask that you would be loved well in this room in Clarksville, Maryland. We honor you, God. We say you are good. You are worthy, worthy, worthy to be praised in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. within me, Lord, bless your holy name, I live my life to worship you alone, you brought me out of darkness into your glorious light, whoever I will 
Jesus, we thank you. I know that all of us are just unworthy because of the sinful nature that we all have. But Lord, that you give us that grace, that mercy, and you saved us from all that, Lord. That when I hear your name, that you call for me, it's because that's already been done. That there's so much that I can serve you, Lord, as a congregation that we can serve you, Lord we stand before you, Lord, that we want to hear your word through Pastor Q, Lord, today, that we can go out and be fulfilled by the blessings that you have for us. There's so much more for us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Before we even get to do any of the work, Lord, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace, God. I lift up this congregation to you, Lord, that I know in your eyes that we are worthy of you, for you. Thank you. That we have the heart today to sit down and listen to your word and just dwell on it, Lord that we can go beyond the things that we think that just wears us down week by week, day by day. Because life demands so much of us, God, and we know that. But Lord, that you call us to do more and see more and be fulfilled based on your word, Lord, that we're more than what we see in a mirror. We care about what you see in us. Thank you, Jesus. So God, for this congregation, I lift up everyone here that can hear your voice clearly. And even if it's not, Lord, I ask for a breakthrough in that clarity. That today that we can stand here and just listen to your voice and that we have a full commandment of what you want us to do for the next couple of months. As the year does wind down, it, that part doesn't matter. It's what we take the step forward in faith that we declare that you are good, God do it out of obedience. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys could stay standing and greet the people around you, say hi. Welcome. It's good to see everyone. <laughs> say hi to people across the room, next to you, all around you. Welcome. Welcome home. Welcome to Hope Church where you guys belong. It's good to see everyone. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump into some announcements. Um, as you guys know, um, I'm the youth pastor at Hope Church, uh, and this Tuesday, uh, we're going to be having our second town hall meeting for all of the chosen parents. Um, as you have probably heard from us, uh, we're transitioning our high school students into a house church model, um, and the first town hall meeting uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback. We've gotten a lot of dialogue. Uh, this meeting will be on Google Meet, so it will be virtual. I've sent out a calendar invite. If you didn't get it yet, please talk to me. Um, it will be at 8.30 p.m., and we'll just go over the game plan and um, how we're going to move forward with that. The second announcement is the coffee house. Uh, we've been announcing it for a while. Um, it's going to be Saturday, November 11th from 4 to 6 p.m. The time is adjusted. That is correct. Um, 4 to 6 p.m. If you have any questions about it, uh, please reach out to Cindy Wen. Um, they are looking for uh, volunteers to help out during the day. So um, we want you guys to uh, feel free to bring your VIP. So it's an event um, that we can invite our VIPs to. So talk to Cindy Wen if you're available to help out with that. Uh, this month's fellowship food is provided by the Thailand Myanmar House Church. Um, this is uh, Susan and Sung's house church, so um, they're not here today, but please thank them for providing all of the food for us. Um, a couple of announcements that don't have slides. The first is that Pastor Mimi is still out of town. She's on vacation until October 17th, so for any questions or concerns, please direct them to Pastor Q. Um, for any youth-related concerns, you can always harass me or talk to any of the leaders. If we'll be around. Um, and the other announcement is that Pastor Q will be out on October 13th and 14th. He will be at an Eco-Presbyterian meeting, okay? 
All right, now we can go into a time of offering and giving. So let's continue worship through offering and giving. You can give um, in three different ways. In person, right here, there's a bucket. You can also mail in a check, and uh, you may also pay through the church center app. So let's continue through giving. Father, we love your house. We love being in the Father's house. We thank you for your presence with us. God, we uh, give the offering to you. It's already yours. We're just um, giving back to you what already belongs to you. And we pray that you would advance your kingdom through the resources. All we have are two copper coins, but we give it to you. And we ask you to do what only you can do, Lord. Uh, bring miracles, bring salvation, and do what only you can do. Bring your kingdom here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children are dismissed. You may go down, have a good time of worship. That is good. I don't know why, but it feels very more empty than usual. If you want to come a little closer, I want to. In fact, I would love to see your face. That would be great. And Pastor Mimi is the only one who's supposedly out of town, but seems like she feels a whole space. I guess she's missing. God is good all the time. Amen. Uh, I have a lot of time today. This is good. Uh, if you can open your Bible to Luke chapter 14, this is the 52nd message on the Gospel of Luke. It has been two and a half years we are going to Gospel Luke, really beholding and really looking unto our Lord Jesus, and, and really portrayed and explained and declared through the Gospel. And so stand. You can follow along with me on the screen with the ESV version. You can follow along in your own Bible as well. Luke chapter 14, verse 15 through 35. The title of the message is, The Cost of Discipleship. And they begin, now great crowds accompanied him, Jesus, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Of words, oh my goodness. He said, and whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who sees it, see it, begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he, he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? If, and if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation, bless you, and asks for terms of peace. Verse 33, therefore, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Verse 34, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Let me finish. Let me read the last sentence again. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. 
It ends the reading of the word of God and God's people say, bless, praise. Thanks be to God. Very good. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Okay. I confuse everyone else. Okay. Before I begin, before I pray and begin the message, let me begin by saying this. I am more and more, really more and more lately, are convinced that we, especially in this first world, Western culture, we have lost of what the gospel really is. And we are so accustomed to this cultural Jesus rather than the biblical Jesus. We live our lives with really this, you know, weird understanding of what it means to be a Christian. I don't know if you know, at least third of the world population says, claims to be Christian. Claim to be Christian. Yet, in our culture, even some years ago, a few years ago, majority of people would say they are Christians now, but we know for sure that it is only in number. This is not true. So, I don't, want to, I don't want this to be a heavy message, but I'm, I'm going at what Jesus is saying. Let's pray. Father, I just come in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our God, God who so loved us, gave you one, one and only begotten Son, and that you may, you came to save us, deliver us, give us life and life eternal. We love you, O oh God. We come right now. We ask that your word, your truth be revealed. More than a nice teaching, we want to see your face. We want you to come in and miss God. Your word become flesh among us. Show us your grace. But I pray for brevity, but clear, clarity in the word, your word, your gospel proclaim today. We knew God, we love you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God is good. We are starting with verse 25. Let me just read verse 25 once again. Now great crowds accompanied him, Jesus. And he turned and said to them. Now, as, and so before I go on, we look at this a little bit. We know the context a little bit. We have spent some time in God, Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus was invited by a, a ruler of the Pharisees to a dinner, a meal on Sabbath day. We know that this was a setup. They, they were not, they were not really, they didn't really invite him. This was a nice gathering. They were invited to test him and trap him. We know that. And, and they had a, you know, a, a man who was sick with edema, which is a swelling of his body there so that they were trying to see whether Jesus would heal on the Sabbath day, which means he'll be breaking the Sabbath law. And Jesus goes on to teach them and really show them the, how, how they miss the heart of God. Heart of God is for the broken heart of God who came to heal and say, who loves us, all that, and, and begin to teach about the kingdom of God. Now he says in verse 25, now great crowds accompany him. He's on the way now. He's not in the house anymore. He's on the way. Where is he going? He's moving toward Jerusalem. We saw this right after the Mountain, mountain transfiguration, as Jesus comes on the mountain, he begins to say, he said his heart and mind to go to Jerusalem. Now, about three years into public ministry, he Jesus knew the time has come. He's going to Jerusalem to die on the cross. This is where he's going. And great crowd, if you look at it, it's great crowds. With the, not just crowd, but crowds. It's the one crowd and many crowds of people. There's a lot of people gathered. Because they love what Jesus taught. They love this teaching was, you know, really heavenly teaching, wonderful teaching. They love how he healed the sick, how he did miracles and all those. They were amazed by all that Jesus has done for them, who he is. Well, they're following him. A lot of people are following him. I don't know whether this bothered Jesus or not, but Jesus looked the turn around and says, begin to speak to them. Listen carefully what he says. Often we think about Jesus as nice 
you know, like a smiling, almost like a hippie-ish kind of picture of Jesus. But you look at what he says here. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, hate his own father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, the person cannot be my disciple. Wait, wait, this doesn't sound right, does it? Does it sound like Jesus? Is, is, is he always preaching about love, forgiving those or even your enemy and all that? How is he saying Jesus, unless you hate your father and mother, you cannot be my disciple? Now, it's a, it's a, this is why some, sometimes when you look at different translations of the Bible, they try to make sense out of it. But Jesus is saying you should hate your mom and dad. Listen, youth group. Yeah, Jesus is saying you should hate your mom and dad, okay? He's not saying that, right? He's not, he's not saying you should hate your father. Noah, he's not saying you should hate your father. Or, or every, you know, he's not. You know what I'm talking about. He's not doing that. But what is he saying? To make it easier to understand, some, some translation will stop today. Look what it says in NLT. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, Hate everyone else. They put a phrase in there which was not in the original scriptures. They should make you understand. Two by comparison. Hate your father. Hate everyone else. Meaning father, mother, everybody else. It's a comparison. Another translation. Uh, good news translation says in, this, says in this way. Those who come to me cannot be my disciples. Unless they love me more than they love Father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and themselves as well. And so, and that's what, how they explained it. I'm not saying this is wrong. They're trying to give, understand what, what does it mean in a tasty version. The most tastiest Bible out there, MSG version says, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, Brothers and sisters, yes, even one's own self can be my disciple. The whole point is that everybody understands Jesus is saying we should hate our mother and father or my wife and children. He's not encouraging and, and the, his followers to turn against their family members. Rather, he's explaining that even devotion to family does not super, supersede the call to discipleship. If you want to follow Christ, you have to have a, he has to be the priority, he has to be utmost priority in life. Jesus told us the great, greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And second is to like it, that is to love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, when you love Jesus, when you begin to follow Jesus, you will be a better husband. You'll love your wife better. You'll love your children better. You'll be a better worker. You'll be better better, you know, uh, employee and all that. If you really follow Christ, this will change your life. On the other end, he's saying, you know, you know, remember, you know, one of the famous stories in the Bible, one of the most dramatic stories in the Bible, when God told Abraham, the man of God, and I will tell, I will the passage, when he told God, told him to sacrifice your son on the mountain, he was not saying, hate your son. He was not saying that. But, you know, he's asking, do you love me more than these? Even your own life. Otherwise, you are not worthy. You cannot follow me. Consider uh, Abraham. You know, consider Abraham, right? In, in Genesis 22, see, this is what God tells, God tells, I don't have to say for this. God tells Abraham, now he came about after these things. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, God says, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. You know the story. I know you heard, you heard the story many, many times. He gets up early, the Bible said, he gets up early next morning. 
chop the wood and get ready and goes off for three day journey to the place God told him he had enough time, ample time to change his mind. To reconsider the thing, obeying God or not. He does go to the foot of the mountain and leaves us, you know, his servant there and goes up the mountain with his son, his son Isaac carrying the wood for the sacrifice. And as you go up, Isaac says, that dad, he's a fire, the wood in the fire, but where is a sacrifice? You know, Abraham says, God will provide. He goes up, he had, you know, get, got the altar ready, and, and I, I don't know how this old man, 100 plus year old man, get his son, who is a teenager, strong young teenager, to be bound and put him on the altar. He raises a knife, verse 10, Abram stretched out his hand and took the knife to, to stay, slay his son. Verse 11 says, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, said, Abram, Abram, he said, here I am. Again, and the angel says, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. That's all. Oh, stop. Don't do it. Stop. And, and God says to the angel, he says, do nothing to him. For now, I know that you fear God, that you love God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son for me. The point of that thing was not that God wanted, to, God wanted Abram to hate his son. No. God was really saying, do you, love me? do you love me more than your son? Do you love me more than the promise I've given you? Am I more, am I more important than all those? What well, doesn't mean to fear God and put God first in your life. He has to be number one. I told this so many times, but you know, whenever I told this, to tell this story, I feel like I must... You know, I, I feel like doing this. You know, when I, you know, all of you heard about, all of you heard about me dating my wife two weeks and, and asking her to marry me. You heard about that. And I remember one of those nights, you know, we popped the, popped the question, that's probably was about a week into that. Every night we went on a date. In Hawaii, you don't need a money, you just need a car. We drove around the islands. And I remember that, that, that day I went into one of the, one of the beach. We, I pulled the car into the beach, and, and I had the headlights into the ocean, and she was sitting next to me. I was driving white Toyota pickup truck, which is a stick. This is so that I will not be tempted. My hand is always occupied with the stick. Anyway, so there I sat there, and I don't know what came over me. I, I told, looked at her and said, Joy, I love you. But I said, I really said this. I don't know why, what made me say it, but I told her, you will always be second in my life. Because God is always first in my life. Sounds great, right? But she didn't say anything for like five minutes. She said, Stupid thing. What did I say? What did I say? About five minutes later, she said, me too. <laughs> Perfect. Right? You know, it's, 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 one of the things I knew as a young 23-year-old, I love this woman, and I want to marry this woman, but I knew something in my heart. I wanted to let her know God is always first in my life. And more than you, you are the best thing that happened in the whole world, but God is always first. You see, Jesus, Jesus said, if anyone wants to come to me and does not hate his father, his own father, mother, and wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his, you know, his own life, if, if you do not love God more than your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Think about this, right? If Abraham didn't obey, and he didn't sacrifice his, his son, he could have his son Isaac living. He could never be what God called him to be, father of nation. He would have never fulfilled his God's calling in his life to be so so blessed for all the families of the earth. You see, God took him higher place to be to really walk and live in God's calling, God's purpose in your life. I, unless there is giving up things and following after him, it doesn't happen. Second thing he says, next verse, next verse in, before I go on, I need to say this. this so some, of this, some of this is from one of my favorite authors, favorite speakers, Joyce Meyer. I love Joyce Meyers. 
I love, she's so good. And uh, one of his things, and I remember following, so one of the things she says, it says, I love this. I'm reading some of this. I, I transcribed her message, literally transcribed, you know, using that, you know, the online word document. There's a difference from uh, receiving Christ as your savior and being full on committed disciple. Listen carefully. Most people so often, they want, they want, a lot of people want just enough of Jesus to stay out of hell. And, but they don't want enough of Jesus to really live a victorious life while they are here and be a benefit somebody, to somebody, some other person other than themselves. Most, a lot of people in America, so-called Christians, who call them the Christians, just want to squeak by into heaven. Just do a little bit, just do one of the least amount of things, but just wanted to get in there quick, squeak by. She says here, I like what she said, don't be that kind of person. Just, you know, and, and don't be just, don't, the, just that the, just does the least bit you can get by with just to squeak into the back door of heaven. If you're going to go, to go if you're going to go do this, Let's go on with it. Give God all that we got. Amen? This is important. You see, it is possible. Well, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't want to say, but it's possible. Just as all the crowds are following him. You may wonder, why are, they, why are you following him? What are you looking for from Jesus? It's possible to be a follower of Jesus without being a disciple. To be a camp follower without being a soldier. This is what this way we are. I see, we see so many people who want just of Jesus enough to be healed, get some blessings. They have no desire for him to be the Lord of their life. They have no desire to walk with him at all. Therefore, missing out what really God has planned for them. When you stand before heaven, before when you stand before God, I don't know whether they'll make it in there. I do not know. You got what you what you're following him on, in the world for. You didn't you follow him for the blessings. Why do you think you should get? You should really really receive what Christ has promised for you. That's not what you what you've been asking for. It costs something to be a disciple of Jesus. I don't know if you know this. It costs more to reject him. Let me go on to second verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He goes on to say, not only hate your mother and father, more than all the relations, you have to be the first in your life. And it says, unless you uh, bear, carry your own cross, your own cross, and follow up, come after me, follow up to me. You cannot be my disciple. Where is he going? He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem. When Jesus said this, he was on the road to Jerusalem. He knew he was on the way to the cross. The cross were with, who were with him thought he was on his way to Jerusalem for, to get, gain, gain his empire. They didn't understand what he was going there for. You know, the, in the ESP version says, right, in verse 23, he's, you know, he's, he, he has said this many times before. Jesus is not the only, this is not the only time. He has said it before. In, in Luke chapter 9, early on, Jesus said, you know, right after coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, carry his cross daily, and follow me, Jesus said. In NASB version, in chapter 10 of Matthew says, Jesus said, he who does not take his cross, follow after me, is not worthy of me. This is not something he has said only once. He said many, many times. You see, at the time, in those days, when Jesus so talked about cross, they knew, exactly knew what it meant. If they have seen it before where Roman soldiers, Roman government came in and, and, and crucified hundreds of people at times. Crucifixion meant crucifying me. Cross meant death, cruel death, suffering, shame. 
She's just saying, will you follow, still follow me? If this is where I'm going and you need to follow me this way. If I'm going to go to Jerusalem and, and die on the cross, you're following this way you're going, are you willing to follow? Will you willing to follow? Jesus is not playing game. He's saying, I don't want you to do following me without understanding where I'm going. This is where I'm going. Are you willing to follow? Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Second time he said it, you cannot be my disciple. It's so important enough for him to repeat this. You cannot be my disciple. And then Jesus, to, to illustrate this point, Jesus tells two parables, two stories that really highlight God's truth, God's principles. Chapter 14, verse 28. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. We, we know this thing. When you're building a house, often, that, oh, this is true, often what they said, how much it costs, often it'll be more. Probably about 20% more. They said about average 20% more than what they said it would be. They said they'll get it done in a month. They usually get it done at least some weeks later, even a month or whatever. You know what I'm talking about. So when you are, you say, Jesus said, give a parable. If you're building a house, before you do, what you, what you do is, Make sure that you have enough funds, you are, you are able to build this thing. You cannot start and then order enough money to finish. Right? You know, it's easy to start anything, isn't it? But difficult to finish. Sunday night after a good dinner, it's easy to start, you know, diet. Right? After Sunday night after dinner, full dinner, I'm going to diet. But the point is, you know, if, if you have money, you can always go buy a treadmill. You know, and the point is not just buying the treadmill. Will you stay, stay on the thing long enough? Will you hold on to your diet long enough? On Wednesday afternoon when you're hungry, you feel like you're starving to death. Will you keep on it? <coughs> Amen. This is why people, you know, this is why every year, January, in the first two weeks, gym is filled with new people. By February, March, nobody out there. This is true. It's easy to start. Will you go all the way? So before you do anything, count the cost. Make sure this is what you want. The second story it tells us is this, verse 31. What king going out to encounter another king in a war? He's in a war battle, right? Will not sit down first and really deliberate and see whether he's able with his 10,000 soldiers Meet the other king with 20,000. You may be skilled, but you, may, you better look out. If, if the guy has twice the size of the, the army, I need to make sure that I'm able to handle it. If I cannot, you better make terms of peace early on. So he doesn't come and not only destroy you, but all the families and your, everything else you're fighting for will be destroyed. So before you start, check it out. Count the cost. Jesus is not just saying, oh, come on, everybody follow me. No, he's saying, are you sure? Are you really sure? One of the best way I know, just, you know, one of the best way I know. I remember just long, many years ago, was when I was loved doing discipling, used to disciple people. Some, some guys, about four guys, said, college kids, that college kids, I want to, can, we, can you disciple us, Pastor Q? I didn't want to. I have two busy, I have no time. You know what I told them? Come on Monday morning prayer at 5.30. After that, we'll have a discipleship. I would say, don't come. I, I, I know you're not going to come. Don't come. That's what I was saying. But they showed up Monday. And all four guys showed up Monday morning at 5.30. And you know what happened? I need to get up earlier than on Monday so that I can disciple them. Well, finally, after a few weeks, fine. I mean, let's meet on Saturday. So I got to disciple those guys on Saturdays. He's just saying... Are you sure before you go in? I need, you need to know what you're getting into. You see, in, this, in, in our Western first world culture, with Christianity being so 
popular, not anymore, but more and more. What happened was, come on, God, if you, go, if you come, God will bless you. God will give you everything you need if you really pray and follow his will. You would have, Lex, you have Lexus in your car, you have a Lamborghini in your driveway. God will bless you. The sign of God's blessing is you would have all the things you need, you want. This is not the gospel. Jesus said, if anybody wants to come after me, let him deny himself, carry his cross daily, and follow after me. I want, to be sure, I want to make sure, and so this is what we've got into last 40, 50 years. America, as well as a lot of countries in the world, many church, we got into this church growth, you know, the movement where we want to grow the church. Come in, we want to make everything comfortable for you. We're not going to say anything difficult for you to listen. We want to make it short, comfortable so you can come. Just come anyway. God will bless you and make it as easy as possible. And we have missed the gospel. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus was always from the beginning. You know what you're getting into. Consider the call of Abraham, right? And consider Abraham again. I talked about chapter 22. Now, when God called Abraham in his first time in his chapter 12 of Genesis, he was 75 year old man, comfortable, rich in his neighborhood. And the uh, Ur Shaldis, which is now Iran in Iraq area. He was comfortable in everything. Now, only thing he's missing was he didn't have a son. God calls him and said, I'm, I, wanna, I want you to call and follow me. I want to give you a new life. And you know what God says in Genesis 12 1? Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, and your father's house to the land which I will show you. It was a calling. Leave everything. You leave your family, leave your culture, leave your, you know, your environment and all that to a brand new place, new language. 75 year old, start anew. There was calling. I was calling him to new life, calling him to life with God. And God brought, bring him in, in the place. And God, then God promised, when you do that, God says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. So you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Why? Why? Why would you do this? How would you give up everything and follow? Because he is worthy. Because he is the only way, only truth, only life. And I talk about my wife often. I don't pay, I don't give her anything for this, but you know, she will just have to ask, fine, do whatever you want. You know, it's a 38, 38 years ago, and 38 years and two months, two months, and four days ago, you know, I walked down the aisle. Actually, there were two aisles in the church. At a double wedding. Me and my brother, younger brother, had a double wedding. We walked down the aisle, and on the aisle, I said, I do, to this woman, you know, and, you know, where the sickness had in health, right? Rich or poor, right? And I said, I do, and I will, you know, I will cherish you, all that. You know, when I said yes to, I was saying, I was saying no to everyone else. You are the one I'm saying yes to. When I say yes to her, I was saying no to every other person out there. She is the one for me. He's the one for me. Isn't that what this thing is about? I was saying by, by yes, I'm saying you are worth everything. You are worth every other people in the world. You are the one I love. You are the one I committed to. You know, what, you know one of the things I pray about, and this is what Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. Let me read verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish, garbage, dung, so that I may gain Christ. It's because Christ, knowing Christ is so much greater. All the things are good to me. Those things I count as nothing and I even... I experience a loss of everything and I give them up 
all that. Why? Because I want to gain Christ. In NLT version, it says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In my MS version, yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master and first and first hand, and know him as in my in first hand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Look at the dog dung. I had a just dumb joke just floating in my mind. I'm not gonna say it, okay? A dumb joke anyway. I've dumped all, dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. There's a song, quite an old song, 30, actually literally 30 years old song. It was written in 1993 by this guy named um, Graham Kendrick. Brock, are you ready? I, I called a special artist to come and help me out. I love this guy. All the songs I love, he, he, he knows, okay? Now look at the words he said. All, all I once held dear, built my life upon. All this world reveres and worst fights to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now. Compared to this, what is that? Knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you, Jesus. You see, here Jesus is saying, he's saying, this is you know, the call. If you follow me, if this is what you are. Or Apostle Paul said, you know what? The reason I do that is because he is worthy. He's glorious. His way is the only way, and he is worth it all. Are you ready? <laughs> later okay you can ask him later okay let me go on let me let me look at the next verse look at chapter uh, 14 verse 33 and jesus is not done yet he says verse 33 there so therefore almost a conclusion so therefore any one of you all the crowd any one of you who does not renounce all that he has 
cannot be my disciple. The third, third time he says, cannot be my disciple. First time, unless you hate your mother and father and all of those. And the second he says, unless you carry a cross and come after me. Third he says, unless you renounce all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Now, NASB, my favorite version, says in this way, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possession. I like the way Holman, the Bible says in this, in the way they say, in the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not say goodbye to all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Literally, Greek word is apotasomai, which means Say goodbye. Take leave off. Third, how did possession? Forsake what one owns. Renounce good. Surrender and give up. Jesus said, unless you say goodbye to your all that you have, all your possessions, you cannot be my disciple. More, especially in the Gospel of Luke, Luke, the Gospel of Luke is more adamant about our others, our giving up our possession. This is why same writer, writer, writer wrote, the book of Acts, chapter 2. When the early church gathered, there were, you remember, people selling their things to give to others who may have need. This is a Christian life we're talking about. Unless you are not, unless you are give up all of your possession, you're not talking about only money only. You're talking about things that hold you back. Things that hold you back. Things that actually hurting you. The things that God is calling you to. You know, let go of the things that's hurting you, not good for you. Some of you may be involved in relationship, make a relationship that making making you compromise and hurting spiritually. Say goodbye. You may have a career, a job. You have to compromise to keep your job. You may have to say goodbye. Am I being, I'm being honest here. I, mean, I, I was, I just, you know, I remember I was having a teacher's, uh, Sunday school teacher's meeting this morning. It was a nice, nice cozy meeting in there. I just remember the story. A number of years, this is a long time, I not in our church, a long time ago, like 30 some years ago, I was discipling some young adults. These were young single adults. And, 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 and uh, there was a, one of the girls, lady who came, and I, I remember her name and everything. She came and told me, Pastor Q, what am I going to do? You know, this old Korean way, right? She was introduced to two guys, two, two different guys. And then she can build a relationship. And, and the, the idea, one of them, she'll choose one of them to get married. One guy was a poor guy studying to be going to ministry. The other guy was still young, but he has a couple of stores. More comfortable set in his ways were not. And what, Pastor Q, what do you think I should do? You decide. You pray about it. You decide. The guy, this guy, the rich guy with the couple of business, whatever, rich guy, not a Christian. He said, when I marry you, I'll go to church. Yes. Did you think he would ever go to church? No. She did choose this guy. Not this guy, this guy. And I never saw her back at church after she got married. You know what I'm talking about. You see, unless you give up all your possession. You cannot follow. You cannot be my disciple. I'm being real here. You know, and, and every part of our life, this is it. And, and following Christ is this. And then he, he, this is, this is, you know, so sometimes you know, sometimes you know that sometimes you find God's finger on your life. You know, you know, God's poking on this thing. You know God's touching you. You know God's saying, no more of this. You feel that. You know, you, you know what I'm talking about. If, you, if you've been walking with God, you know God has a finger on you. More difficult, it is more, it is more, more painful to let go. That means it's more stronger grip on you. God says, let this go. This is just killing you. This is not hurting you. When God says, let go, it's not because he, it's not because he wants you to be poor and, and angry and unwell. No, he wants best for you. This is, that is not good for you. You need to let go. I'm talking about giving up here. There's something you may need to give up. Really to follow Christ. I remember what Pastor Lana, the missionary Lana shared about a month ago when she was with us. She said, God is calling us to step out of the boat and step up. 
To do that, you need to let go of your fear. You need to let, let go of things you're holding on, things you're relying and depending on. You have to let go. That's why God told Abraham to leave your family, leave your all that, so that you can go to a place where you learn to trust in God and walk with God. You'll live the life that God called you to live. Brand new people God is making. So say, it's about saying goodbye to self-will, self-centered life, to say hello to God's will, God's life. Amen. This is from um, Joyce Meyer, and she, she shares about testimony about how when she felt like God calling her to go into ministry, and yet she, she and her husband was not making enough to make a living. And then she said, God, she said, God I'll compromise. I'll, I'll do half-time half -time work, and then I'll study the rest of the time to study to, to ministry. Okay, she said she did that. Guess what happened? She got fired. I never got fired. I'm a good worker. And she, she, she said something very interesting. She said she was trying to give God a sacrifice instead of obedience. Listen carefully. Sometimes we want to give sacrifice to God instead of obedience. I don't want to forgive that guy, God, but I will go to church twice, next, two more times next week. I'll give you more offering next week, but I cannot forgive this guy. You know what I'm talking about. We would rather give a sacrifice rather than obedience. God does not care about your sacrifice. God rather have your obedience. Amen? And, 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 and so think about that. I want you to think about it. What, what things do you need to say goodbye to? Because you might, you might follow Christ. And Jesus doesn't end there. He has, has a couple more things. Very interestingly, I really never knew what, how it did connect it. But in verse 34, Jesus says, salt is good. Huh? Salt? What, the salt? what is salt doing here? But if salt has, has lost its taste, how shall it saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soul or the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has an ear, let him hear. Let him hear. Jesus says, Salt is good only if it's salt. If you lose its saltiness, what is, it, what is it good for? Nothing. It's good for nothing. You know, I, I, I love this analogy. I saw something. When you squeeze the orange, what do you get? When you squeeze apple, what do you get? When you squeeze grape, what do you get? When you squeeze Christian, what do you get? Christ should come out of you. When you are pressed in your life as a Christian, what should come out? Christ likeness should come out. You see, when a salt loses saltiness, it's no use. A Christian without Christ in them is no use. Without Christ living in you, without that, that's no use. And we have so many people calling them just Christians. They are not willing to follow Christ at all. They are fair whether they are only there for certain things. They are not there to follow him. If anyone wants to come up to me and he does not hate his father, mother, his wife, children, brother, the sister, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Unless you, whoever does not carry his own cross and come up to me, follow up to me, cannot be my disciple. And any one of you who does not give up, say goodbye to all his possession, cannot be my disciple. He's calling us, isn't it? Final, that's a final, my final start. Are you saying yes to his call to follow? What, what I really believe God is saying, you know, do not play the fence anymore. Just come to O'Neill. No more playing games outside. If you want to come up to Christ, come. You know what Bible Jesus said? Go and make Christians of all the nations. No, he didn't say that. You make disciples of all the nations, right? Disciples of all the nations, not Christians. Disciples of all the nations. Have you said yes to this call to follow? Let me also ask one more question. Are you saying yes to him today? 
by saying yes to him today. Today, we usually, first Sunday of the month, we com celebrate communion, but last Sunday, because we had a, a picnic, we thought we would do it today. Today is second Sunday, uh, but we are having communion. I want you to, as, as a pastor, Jason, get ready to lead us in the communion. Christ, who came and gave up everything out of heavenly glory, to save us, deliver us, give us life, who went to the cross for our sake, says, come, follow me. This is the only way. This is the only way, this is the only way to life. There's no other way. This is the only way. Come. That's what communion is about. His way is way of the cross. On the cross, you'll find every answer we need. On the cross, you'll find all the answers to the world, the problems. And on the cross, you'll find answers to all the sin problems in the world. Come to the cross. Let the priest come. And let the uh, children to let children know that you can come up. This is not an, an this is not a heavy message. It's not saying don't do this, don't do that. It's really about following the Spirit of God. You follow the Spirit as Holy Spirit leads you. You follow Him. That's what Christian life is about: following the Spirit of God who lives in us. He leads us, you obey and follow him. You walk in his way. Let's come to God in prayer. Lord, you say, come to me. All of you are weary and heavy burden, I will give you rest. The way of, you call us into way of rest actually is following after you, God. Father, we want to be more like you. We come and say, God, we want to go where you go. We want to be concerned about things that you think about, you desire for us. But we want your joy and grace. We want to dive in deep into your love and grace, God. We don't want to play on the boundaries anymore. We want to go in and follow you, God, in all the way. We say, I have this. we have decided to follow Christ. So turning back, cross before me. Cross before me, world behind me. Even though no one joined me, I will follow Christ. I love you, Lord Jesus. You are our God. We worship you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Let's all stand.
Communion Sunday. Um, one of the things that is fundamental to Christianity, a promise that He gave to us in His Scripture, is that He would never leave us or forsake us. That He would walk with us. That He would commune with us. Oh, you guys can be seated. And that promise is that He's going to be with us. And if you're like me, um, whenever you're presented with a decision in your life. A lot of times I'll do an analysis, pros and cons, try to figure out what's the best decision for me and my family. But it really boils down to this: which decision is going to help you love Jesus more? Which decision is going to bring you closer to God? It's really simple. And relationship with God does not start with us doing anything for Him. Relationship and communion with God starts because He's already done it for us. Relationship with God begins at the cross of Jesus Christ, where His body was broken for us. That's where it all begins. That's where it always comes down to. So wherever you're at, whether you're faced with different decisions or challenges in your life, the invitation is: is let's start at His feet again. Let's start at the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he had a meal with his disciples, and he said, "Take this." And he broke the bread and said, "This is my body that was broken for you." That was the good stuff. And then he took the wine, he poured it in a cup, and he said, "Drink. This is the blood of the new covenant." That was shed for you. And then they had communion the day after he gave himself for his disciples and for us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We marvel at the cross today. Your invitation to us was to be in communion with you, and you did it for us, God. You paid for it all, and the, the invitation, Lord, is to come and follow you.、And、just like Pastor Q preached today, it's not about doing good things; it's about following you, and it often comes through obedience. You desired obedience and not sacrifice. So here we are, God. As we partake in communion today, we thank you for these elements. We thank you for everything you've done. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. If I could have. The offer or the communion, folks, help out. You guys can come and line up on both sides to receive the elements.
Jesus, we honor you. We thank you for the cross, and we thank you that you made us right with the Father. You made us right in your eyes, and so we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's take communion together. Why don't we stand and we'll sing a closing song together. disciple who does not give up all his possessions. Come, follow me. Come and follow me, Jesus says. Draw near. As, as always, after the benediction, if you need some prayer, God is speaking to you, dealing in your heart. I want to invite you to come. We'll pray together. Pastors will be up here and pray with you. And uh, Especially if there are things you do know God has been saying for you to give up in order to follow closer to our God. If that is you, come, we want to pray, pray with you. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God, be upon all who are gathered here, be upon all who say, God, yes, I, am fo I follow you turning back. Be upon all church from now until forever and evermore. Amen. Amen.